So now in this last look at cleavage patterns, which we'll entitle Cleavage Patterns 3. Here we'll just summarize and conclude the other forms of cleavage patterns that we see in nature. So we're going to group together uh, a big class of cleavage patterns um, that follow or are within things like echinoderms, um, mammals, which are you and I, of course, and also annelids. So, broadly speaking, if we group these together, we have the same cleavage patterns as each other. What are these cleavage patterns, and what is the effect of the cleavage patterns on development? Well, first of all, all three of these groups of organisms have relatively little amount of yolk. They have a little amount of yolk. Therefore, we will all have a relatively low influence of yolk on cleavage because if there's a lot of yolk, like let's say in a frog, it's going to have an influence on cleavage. If there's a little bit, it's not going to have as much of an influence. We will also undergo, like the frogs, holoblastic cleavage. And remember, holoblastic cleavage, hollow means whole, so complete cleavage. This would mean that the cleavage furrow, even though there's some yolk there, not a lot, but even though there's a little bit of yolk, the cleavage furrow, that indentation in the middle, passes entirely through the egg. It does not care if there's yolk on one side or not. It'll pass entirely through the egg. And this idea of holoblastic cleavage will actually make a little bit more sense, hopefully, when we talk about the opposite in the next group of organisms. In addition, echinoderms, mammals, and annelids, unlike frogs, will form a central blastocoel. So frogs do not form a central blastocoel because they have that yolk that interferes with their development of the blasto, uh, of the of the blastula, and thus, therefore, their blastocoel will be sort of only on one side at that animal pole. Our blastocoel will be right in the middle. It's the central cavity that forms. And in addition, unlike frogs, we will have ra relatively similar sized blastomeres. So every time we do a division, every time we go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, all of these cells will be relatively similar sized. They will eventually result in a blast blastula with a blastocoel in the center, and they will undergo holoblastic complete cleavage. Why is this going to be relatively uniform? Well, that's because there's a little amount of yolk, thus a little influence, not as much influence on yolk, of yolk on cleavage patterns. Remember how we said yolk has a influence, it depends on the species, here's that clear dependence on species. In addition, let's take a look at the exact sort of, not opposite, but in a drastic difference that we see in a different group of organisms. You'll notice something about these groups of, or this, these organisms, like birds, like reptiles, like fish, and like insects. For the most part, what do all these have in common? Take a second. It's not that hard. These all lay eggs. And these eggs, as you probably know, have lots of yolk. So their development of an embryo is an egg, right? It happens externally. Technically, uh, it's you know an internal development of the egg, and then the egg is laid, and then it has development within an egg. And all of that development has to happen with a lot of support, a lot of nutrients. And that comes from a yolk and lots of yolk. So Speaking of these birds and reptiles, fish and insects, well, we notice that the cleavage furrow itself, the middle indentation that has to form, that cleavage furrow can't, it physically cannot, it can't pass entirely through the egg. The yolk is just too thick. The yolk is just too omnipresent. It's too big, it's too much in the way. So that would mean, by process of elimination, Birds, reptiles, fish, and insects cannot undergo, right here, holoblastic cleavage. They must undergo something else, and they do. They undergo something called miroblastic cleavage. So here, miro, which is a Greek term, this just means partial. So because there's this big influence of yolk, the blastula, remember, it's going to be dividing and we're creating blastomeres, they're going to partially undergo cleavage. There's going to be a partial cleavage event. Why would that be? Well, the whole egg, a whole egg will not be dividing, but parts of the egg will be dividing, and that's going to be 
uh, labeled as the only region uh, with uh, only the region without yolk will be actively dividing, uh, undergoes cleavage, in other words. And that's a big difference that we see. And what we notice is that um, amphibians are very much related to, you know, reptiles and fish, and thus, therefore, they almost undergo meroblastic cleavage, but they actually don't. They have a holoblastic cleavage and development, and thus, they will still have a greater influence of their yolk uh, on their overall cleavage patterns as compared to echinoderms, mammals, and annelids, but not enough to be considered meroblastic. Meroblastic is an extreme amount of yolk that causes an extreme amount of division only on one side, and only the region without the yolk will be undergoing the cleavages. So that covers our look at cleavage patterns. In the next and final video, we will finally answer the question about why we need such a large egg. Why is there always going to be a large egg formed as a result of oogenesis in all species?